Hi, I'm Sharad Kutin and welcome to Let's Talk, the show that brings you the most important conversation in arts, culture and ideas. Today we're going to be looking at uh, the Bo Cameroonian Awards, or rather the, the recipients and awardees from that recently concluded award ceremony. Uh, and looking today at musical theatre, I have with me Terence Toh and Chia uh, Yu Hua, who are both uh, they are collaborators on a production called Euphrasia the Musical, and also uh, Terence worked on uh, The Working Dead, which is uh, the uh, kind of musical comedy uh, for which he won an award for best um, original book. Book there yeah, is a reference to the storyline that they wrote. Okay, mm -hmm. so your collaborators and also Terence Jokes, you worked. Um, on the musical uh, comedy *The Working Dead*, I just want to begin uh, with, um, and I, I congratulate both of you. But <laughs> I want to so begin much. with yeah. um, what musical theatre is in a Malaysian context, and maybe for people who've never experienced musical theatre, uh, what this would have been. What would they have seen if they walked in uh, on uh, *The Working Dead*, for instance? Terence, let's begin with you. What? What was *The Working Dead*? Musical comedy. Sounds um, <laughs> pretty simple at some level. Yeah, in some ways, but uh, not that simple to write, let me tell you <laughs> that. Yeah. So, well, the, the Working Dead is a musical comedy based on this. Uh, it's about basically the corporate life, and we use sort of, you know, corporate zombies. Uh, they are sort of used as a metaphor for people who work too hard and devote themselves purely to work without thought of family or anything else. So, we just I, we liked this idea, and we thought, you know, why don't we make a musical about it? Which okay. on hindsight was harder than we thought, but I think it turned out a lot better. Than okay, so this is based on your experience. You're a journalist, I understand. Yes. You work at the Star. Uh, you, you treat badly. I mean, is that, <laughs> what, is that where else it comes from? No, 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 no. I mean, I have no complaints about my work. The people there are fantastic, but well, I, how there are a lot of stuff because overwork is somehow it's a thing when it comes to it's not this country but Asia. Yeah, and I think it's worldwide too, right? In many yeah. ways, uh, corporate culture. Uh, you, who, I mean, yeah. you, you work for Chili Sauce, uh, which yeah. is an online portal. Um, tell us about, I mean, how much of you went into the story? Oof. Uh, I think there were some lines. I think generally, you know, when you're writing, when you're writing any script at all, um, a part of what, you know, your, your voice enters uh, the script. So I think there were some lines that uh, some people said, like, I think you who wrote that. Yeah, because you know, you know, yeah, a lot of people right. are trying to guess like which parts yeah. you wrote and which parts I wrote. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so are these, I mean, and this is, I think, the the very interesting fact of uh, Malaysia is that we have a very small art scene, but we also have a huge amount of diversity within mm. the art scene, and that I think is uh, makes it very difficult, especially for judges. I, I was a a Bo Cameroonian judge myself for two oh. years, so I know the difficulties in oh, trying yeah. to you know uh, compare sometimes very different types of traditions and. I, I want to ask you about this uh, question of musical theatre. Uh, it doesn't have deep roots. I mean, I, th I think of Chinese opera as one, mm -hmm. or maybe um, you know, uh, 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 the more uh, Bangsawan theatre as, as a kind of precursor to um, the musical theatre of today. But I think musical theatre often seen as, as a very American thing. Mm -hmm. Though Europe has the operas and such. Uh, tell us, I mean, from you, where do you draw inspiration? Is it American musical theatre? Do you draw on Bangsa One? Do you draw on you know <laughs> the Peking Opera? What what is it that you feel your inner resources are coming from? Well, for me, me personally, when I was growing up, I did watch a lot of uh, Western musical theatre. I wasn't that lucky enough to be able to go to you know America or England, but I watched a lot of uh, you, you know recordings, movies, videos. I think my parents were fans. You know, they exposed me to the soundtracks and so on. So. I would say a lot of my influences does come from the Western you know, School of Musical Theatre. Although, I think over the years, I've been a f exposed to a few more you know, Asian, Malaysian art scenes. So, I've been trying also to take a few you know, influences and all that in there. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. American. Yes. Okay, what about you, Hiwa? I mean, it, yeah. you know, um, is it, I mean, there's a generation that grew up on Glee, as it were, mm. and they might be you know, really influenced by that as, you know, as a form of music, combining mm. music and story together. Yeah. For you, what were the influences? Ooh, um, I think mine were mainly a lot from childhood. So, you know, there was uh, what you see on TV, you know, uh, The Sound of Music, uh, Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of Music is, is a generation before yours. I mean, it's my generation. Well, Glee not was not yeah. my generation. <laughs> okay. So, but, yeah. so tell us more about the, mm. the kind of influences that led you to want to actually create a musical theatre uh, production. Um, I, think, I think it was basically for me, like, I, 
I, I like writing poetry and, uh, you know, it was kind of like, how, how do I merge those two together? And I think, in fact, uh, before we started, I, I asked Terrence, like, mm -hmm. so do I just write poetry and then have it, have someone? <laughs> yes, I remember that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, put it to music. And, and then he correct you immediately? He, he not immediately. Not immediately, but... I let you know, him come to the decision on his head. All right, yeah, yeah, very yeah. generous of you, Terence. <laughs> Terence, uh, are either of you trained in actually doing this? Because it's a craft, right? It, mm -hmm. it has its own parameters. It has, uh, you know, we talked about tradition earlier, but it also has ways of working. Mm. How do you combine storyline, uh, you know, the plot development, the, the uh, um, character, but also the music component? You wrote lyrics. Did you write the music? Tell us a little more about that process. Well, for me, it's, uh, I, I work with uh, collaborators. My friends, uh, Lydia Tong is my composer. And for, okay, for the working date, Lydia Tong was my composer. Kelvin Lowe was my music director. So I would write the story and the lyrics first. And then they would sort of put it to music. And it astounded me every time how, you know, like they managed to all, almost always make it sound like what is in my head. So it's a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion. Yeah, but it's a fun effort always to see how it turns out. Right, and then for you, uh, you know, you say you wrote poetry, uh, and there's of course music in poetry and, and in words, but uh, the, the, you know, taking uh, those words and into a lyric form, uh, and then into music, uh, and, mm. and have it integrated into something like a drama, right? I mean, yeah. it's complex, huh? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, when I first when I first saw the uh, the first reading uh, for for Euphrasia, it kind of it was kind of mind blowing a little bit because it's it's like I don't recognize that I wrote it. So yeah, so so it's very different because um, you know you you kind of have a certain tune in your in your head as you are kind of writing it, right? But uh, sometimes it's there, and sometimes you know the the composer just takes a very different take on it, which is still good. And, and a lot of the fun is just trying to like see how everything fits together. Right. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, um, the Euphrasia, very different. It's not a musical comedy. It might have comedic elements to it. Uh, but Terence, I uh, understand it's based on the life of uh, a nun. Or yes. Is, a character. Yeah. is it a real historical character? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tell us a little mm. bit more about that then. Well, uh, yeah, her name was uh, Mary Euphrasia. She was this nun who lived in uh, France a long time ago. She was the founder of the... Good, uh, the Good Shepherd Sisters, Good, Good Shepherd Sisters, yeah. yeah, that's all. And even today, you know, her organization is active all around the world. They provide lots of help to, you know, especially, you know, women and uh, victims of trafficking and, you know, just basically the underprivileged. So right, so it's an it's a order within the Catholic Church it's, which is service orientated. Yes. And what inspired you to, to create a musical around her? Well, actually, uh, we were sort of commissioned to sort of uh, do this. Yeah. Uh, by whom? By the Good Shepherd Sisters themselves. Yeah. All right, yeah. wonderful. So they thought this would be a wonderful uh, character to drive a story around yes. the work they do. Okay, yeah. we'll take a short break uh, and we'll get back with more. We're talking about the recipients of the Bo Cameroonian Awards uh, on Let's Talk. Hi, and welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm Sharad Kutit. My guests today, Terence To and Chia Yuhua, they're both uh, involved in musical theater and in two productions that uh, were both nominated and, of course, uh, also received awards at the recent Bo Cameronian Awards. Uh, they are The walk Working Dead, because uh, a play on The Walking Dead <laughs> zombie uh, story, and also uh, Euphrasia, the musical based on the life of a Catholic nun uh, from France. Um, let's um, kind, of, kind of continue um, on, on Euphrasia for a while. Um, you, who are, you were also, this is where you collaborate. You collaborated on Euphrasia, the musical. Um, what did you have to kind of do in order to uh, create uh, music or lyrics that would be consistent with the life of somebody in a very different cultural context, mm -hmm. in a very different period in history? What was it that was the challenge for you there? Um, actually, it was, um, I mean, the first thing when, uh, when we were approached, right, you know, we were like, 
how do you write something about a nun, especially you know who lived like you know two hundred years ago, two hundred plus years Whoopi ago? Was Whoopi Goldberg and her nun series? See, that was the first <laughs> thing that came <laughs> that, to that mind. That did come into okay, yeah, of course, very yeah. disruptive, isn't it? Okay, tell yeah. us. Then what happened? How so, do you get over Whoopi Goldberg? Yeah, so so we did we did discuss like you know mm -hmm. was that a direction that we wanted to go yeah. in, and we you know after looking at her her life story and everything, we realized that there were a lot of things, a lot of themes that were still relevant today. You know, mm -hmm. uh, things like tra human trafficking, uh, things like, um, you know, the patriarchy, yeah. stuff like that. Um, you know, they, they are still relevant today as they were during her time. So those were the kind of elements that we wanted to include as being part of the challenges that, you know, she and, you know, the people around her had to face. And, you know, without making it about that. Yeah, so it was kind of like what she would do. And, you know, luckily there were a lot of texts that kind of, had mm -hmm. you know um, that that documented you know the things that she did. So so those were the parts that we added into the story. Right. As well. So I those were all real. Yeah. Well, so okay. of course it could be very dry to have somebody's mm. CV put on stage. I mean, yes. uh, Terence, um, when we think about musical theater, so much of it is the spectacle. Right. You mm -hmm. walk into a space, a venue. You're looking at the set. You're looking at uh, lighting. Lighting is extraordinarily important. To change the mood in your and the audience's relationship to what they're seeing because you know, uh, they had to, as it were, pretend that yes. it's real mm -hmm. and, and then be drawn in. So tell us, what were the considerations for Euphrasia in terms of lighting, staging, uh, and those elements that often don't get celebrated as much as the acting or the music? Ah, uh, yes. I mean, of course, you know, that was all a consideration, but that I would say it was, uh, I think, our director, Dominic Luke, the very talented Dom, who I think he had the main decision. He looked at us, I mean, of course, we wrote things like, because there are things in our musical that can be difficult to pull off on stage. Like, for example, like the climate, oh, spoilers, but that's okay. <laughs> they build a tunnel at the end. So, of course, it's going to be very difficult to put, you know, an actual tunnel on stage. But we just wrote that. And it was up to Dom, and I think in his vision of how to translate all our things, you know, how we saw it into what was capable on stage. And I think he did a great idea in like, he allowed us freedom to sort of do, you know, like write what we wanted and all that sort of thing. But also I think he sort of saw and he could rein in it very well. So it translated fantastically on stage. Right. And I, and I come back to, again, this, uh, the, um, the essence of this, uh, from a production point of view, of how collaborative uh, musical theatre and theatre is in general. Um, you know, Yuhua, the, the question that comes to mind now is that in, in a world where increasingly you know, the concerns around public health and the, the COVID-19 uh, cri uh, mm -hmm. crisis is how do you produce art? How do you produce something that's so uh, intensely collaborative? Um, you know, in, in this current climate. I mean, is that something that you're concerned about as somebody who's had this experience working musical theatre? Um, yeah, I think that is a, uh, it's an ongoing concern, I think uh, even more so now. Um, I think before this, it was always kind of like, you know, how do you, how do you compete against, you know, film? How do you compete against the cinema and, you know, stuff like that? And we always say that, you know, it's a, it's a live thing. You have to feel, you know, the, the, the production. But, you know, with, with the current pandemic situations, you, you don't even have that anymore. So a challenge now, I think, for a lot of theatre makers is to see how we can, you know, incorporate elements of that live feeling into something that's digital. So like, um, you, know, it could be some, you know, it could be just creating a show uh, based around you know, technologies that we currently have like Zoom and uh, Facebook Live and stuff like that. So uh, one thing that I recently discovered like a month ago was that if you want to clap now, you just V. Yeah, you just put a V in the comments. Oh, you put a V in the yeah, comments? Yeah, you put a V okay. in the comments. So that signifies clap. I don't know where that I came from. I don't know how much, um, you know, uh, energy you can draw as a performer, for instance, you mm -hmm. can draw from the V uh, gesture <laughs> that's yeah. now typed into the comment yeah. section. I mean. Uh, I don't want to be um, negative about it, but I mean, Terence, I, I, I find it extraordinarily challenging that I don't think theatre uh, you know, can be easily translated into mm. digital form because it, it flattens the experience out. Yeah. Uh, we go to theatre to, to have the, the mm. feeling of mm. the, other, the, uh, the audience with us. Right? We're yes. all together. It's, a, it's almost a communal experience. Mm -hmm. so how, 
how is it possible? I mean, do we just have to wait for the vaccine and, uh, <laughs> and it'll come, yeah. to come soon? What's your, th soon, your yes. thoughts on um, replicating or transforming the theater experience uh, in these current times? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I completely agree with you. It's just not the same, you know, watching something mm. on Zoom or YouTube or whatever compared to the real thing. I mean, part of the magic of theater is, you know, the immediacy, the relevancy, you know, being there and seeing the scene unfold in front of you, come to life in, by, in front of your eyes. So, you know, having it online is definitely not the same. That said, you know, now, you know, unfortunately with the pandemic, you know, it's a little difficult. We still do want to see these things. So, I mean, for now, I think this is the way to go. I mean, it's like a second best thing, la, I would say. But then again, you know, I think what we have to realize is that, I would say, uh, online theatre and, you know, the real theatre that most of us are used to are going to be are two completely different things. You know, what works on one medium is not necessarily going to work on another medium. But at the same time, you know, there might be some wonderful things that you can do on Zoom today, you know, that maybe you can't do on, uh, you know, regular theatre. Like, for I mean, as an example, maybe you can do close-ups and stuff like that. Right, so in, so in some sense, it becomes film, right? It becomes mm -hmm. that other medium that allows you uh, a variety of perspectives that you don't have when you're sitting, uh, you know, in a proscenium arch uh, theatre, or even in a theatre in the round, you, you're kind of... Uh, fixed in your perspective, you know, when you're watching a theatre production uh, and you don't have the, the multiple vantage points that uh, film can bring to it. So, um, is there a lot of talk between the two of you, between your collaborators about where to go next, uh, recognising the limitations now? You what? Um, there, there, there has been. Uh, so, I think, you know, we, we did try something actually over, over the MCO period. Um, it was a sketch comedy show called uh, Indie Cine Live. The Quarant Stream edition. Yeah, the Quarant Stream edition. Yeah. So uh, Terence and I yeah, were, we were both writers. Right, and there are many editions. So. I, I think I've, I've been to one of those editions. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what was the experiment is in essence? So it was basically to see if we could, you know, do something like a uh, Saturday night live kind of experience. But, you know, everything was live. So it depended on, you know, a lot of technical things like uh, the connection being strong enough that no one's connection dropped off because the actors were all in their respective houses. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, and, you know, certain things like what we could do live and uh, what we couldn't, I think it was about 80% live? Yeah, I would say, yeah. I yeah, think it was 80% live. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like, okay uh, let's take a pause and we'll come back to this. I really want yeah. to ask uh, about the audience, audience experience and what they will yeah. cough out uh, <laughs> uh, for, you know, theatre online. Uh, stay tuned to Let's Talk. Welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm Sharad Kutin. With me, Terence To and Chia Yuhua, uh, both collaborators in two musical theatre productions, uh, Euphrasia the Musical and The Working Dead, uh, recipients of the Bo Cameronian Awards recently. Coming back to the, to the audience, I'll pick up on uh, Indie Cine, uh, this yeah. latest edition, Yuhua, you were talking about it. Um, actors in different faces, concerns about Wi-Fi mm -hmm. connection, um, uh, but what about the audience? So what could you gauge? I mean, you, what numbers yeah. did you have uh, for this? For in, and oh. did you make them pay? Uh, so we, we had a target of uh, 15,000 yeah, 15, 15, ringgit. ringgit. And yeah, we didn't charge ticket money, but we, rather we asked for donations for KL Pack. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hit the target, I think. Um, Quite, uh, quite, yeah. Oh, yeah, so quite you, close, like 14, you asked the donations plus. of yeah. 15,000 to cover production costs? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how many um, members, uh, how many audience, what was the box office like in terms of people viewing? Oh, I don't remember that number. Well, it was okay. in the yeah. hundred. It was, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think so, I can't recall. Uh, so yeah. is the donation model then uh, the, the way to go? Because I'm thinking about what you charge for those various productions. I think it was 88. I mean, not, mm. not part of the, mm -hmm. if you bring your boss, you get a discount uh, oh, price. Yes. 88 yeah, was the price. That, yeah. And I'm not quite sure what Euphrasia, you charge for Euphrasia. But okay, let's say that's the uh, reality of what it would cost mm -hmm. uh, so that everybody, it's a win-win for everybody in the, in, and all stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, Terence, that um, 
audiences are willing to pay that kind of money for an experience that looks much more like YouTube and not like going to the theatre? Hmm. That is a very good question. And I think that um, it, would, it comes down actually to, I think, any sort of entertainment. If you are offering something that is good, that they want to see and they derive value for, I think that they will pay for it. It's just as long as it's you know not unreasonable and you sort of give them what you promise. I think that yeah, maybe this is possible. Okay. Mm. What about you? You are do you do you think because there's like a deficit yeah. right from the from the point mm. of the experience? People yeah. come, it's an outing. They drive all mm. the way. I mean, actually, there's a lot of inconveniences to yeah. going to a real mm -hmm. theater production that you don't have when you can sit at home and watch it. Mm -hmm. But there's also yeah, the downside, which is that it isn't a social experience. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you think people I, are willing to pay? I, I, I'm kind of like two ways about this, I think. Like, I, I think like, you know, for people who have experienced theatre and who enjoy the experience, I think they will pay for it. But on the other hand, I'm thinking that, you know, what, what we are, what, you know, a lot of theatre groups are doing now uh, by going online is kind of reaching this new demographic who may never have you know, been interested to watch theatre in the first place and to see what local Malaysians, Malaysian productions can do. You know, so it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of a two-way thing. Like, that one may not make that much money, but, you know, you're kind of gaining audiences for the future who may pay money, you know, oh, in the future. Oh, that's a very interesting way yeah. to think about it. Either of you, I'm going to ask Terrence, have you paid for online theatre yourself? Have I paid for online Because you now myself. you know there's a national theatre in Britain. I mean, there's German theatre companies ah, yes, that are yes. putting things online. And, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes the, the cost is very low. It's like, you know, it could be three to five euros mm -hmm. for production and stuff. But yourself, have you ever paid for that experience? Well, actually, well, I am paying for a show in the future. Yeah, um, I, Joe Gutas is putting up Para on Zoom, and uh, yes, I am buying a ticket for that one. Okay, so you're mm. contributing to a future production of something that's been staged before, right? But Para it, has yes, been, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what about you? I, mean, I don't mean to put you yeah. on the spot, because yeah. I, I too are uh, often uh, this dilemma, right? I have yeah. Netflix and I have this and that, yeah. which I happily pay yeah. for. And then theatre, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, how do I pay? It's a bit fiddly, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you want to get into a European scene. Um, yeah. So by, by your estimation, people are now not only exposed to Malaysian theatre, they could be exposed to global theatre. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But would you pay? Have you paid? Uh, I have not. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of just, I guess I'm still a bit more traditional in the sense that I've paid for, you know, the Calpac stuff. Uh, online, i kind of just waiting to see what shows go up first. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. The waiting is, mm. an, is interesting because in some ways I think artists mm. have been forced to give uh, their work for free in order to gain the trust or build uh, the audience mm. willing to, to enter into this experience. And it seems an unfair thing because first of all, artists are paid so badly already oh, yes. and yes. then for them yes, to have yes. to give things away free seems uh, particularly unfair. Terence, uh, you know, there's been some, um, you know, government support for the, the arts. Do you see enough of it happening? Did it, have you been ever a recipient of a grants, government grants to, to do your work? Well, as of now, no, I have not been a recipient of any grant or anything like that. I mean, there are uh, uh, quite a few of these out there. I think that they've been doing a good job so far, but I think that there also could be a lot more, I think. I, I think that, you know, some of them have very stringent rules and, I mean, you know, it's their, their right to do all that sort of thing, but I would like to see a lot more support and a lot more for, a lot of, for more diverse productions also. Right, okay, and what about yeah. you, Yuhua? I mean, um, do you carry on? Government yeah. support, don't support, doesn't matter. You know, you, you have this impulse to create. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. Like, I, I don't know, like, you know, the, the, the monetary support for productions is great, but I think more than that, there needs to be more push to make the arts more available to the people, uh, mm. whether in terms of education or just awareness. Right, okay, yeah. arts education in schools, I think, mm. would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, then, then people don't have to reach adulthood before they start to <laughs> realise yes. that all, all of it is out there. I do want mm. very quickly uh, ask you, Terence, uh, Yuhua, are you involved in any future productions that we should be looking out for? 
Mm. Mm. Oh, big well. pause, yeah. dead air. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so not yet. You're, not you're yet. Not yeah, with the pandemic and all that. Yeah. Right. And mm. you're both working stiffs, both journalists, mm. yes. chili sauce, the star. Uh, and of course, I was joking about the, you know, the wretched conditions and stuff. That was only a joke. Um, you know, tr tremendous respect for the people uh, at that newspaper. Okay, well, thank you guys again for coming on the show, sharing experiences, and congratulations on your awards uh, for being involved in, you know, the creation of a wonderfully diverse and vibrant cultural scene. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us. Okay, yes. I've been speaking to Terence To and Chia Yuhua, both uh, involved in musical productions, The Working Dead and, the, and Euphrasia the Musical, uh, which won awards at the recently concluded Bo Cameroonian Awards. Uh, this is Let's Talk. I'm Sharad Kutin, only on Astro One E. <laughs>